What I want to talk about is actually right in line with what we've just been discussing. Tonight I want to take a look at one of the lesser known figures of the Reformation. He's also an unsung hero in the creation of some of the earliest English Bible versions. That's Miles Coverdale. Miles Coverdale was a quiet, competent, and responsible scholar who supported many of the major figures of the Reformation. Now, it may have been that his background role kept him out of the sight of the Inquisition and other groups that were persecuting Protestants, or the people that wanted to stop the printing of the English Bible just in general. Now, Miles was born in 1488. There's not a lot known about his early years. Surviving records give the place of birth as Yorkshire County in England. And young Miles studied philosophy and theology at Cambridge University. And he was awarded the Bachelor of Canon Law in 1513. And there was a reason he studied that. Because in 1514, Miles was ordained as a priest. In the mid-1500s, he became an Augustinian friar, and he entered their house in Cambridge. Now, it was here in Cambridge that Coverdale was introduced to Robert Barnes. Now, Barnes was one of the first of several highly influential people that Coverdale was going to bump into into his life. And it's, it, I always find it interesting that these guys they just seem to kind of bump into each other. Uh, I don't think it was a coincidence for one, and the other is kind of the way their society was built. Um, the best way I could ever, it came to me, and you probably won't get this reference, is the Yardbirds. Huh? Yardbirds, the British band, the Yardbirds. Okay, Eric Clapton, Jimmy Page, and Jeff Beck all grew up in the same general area, like same county in England. They all knew each other. They hung out with each other. All of these bands, you know, they all kind of went to school together. You know, the guys in the Rolling Stones knew the Beatles, and you know, you know, that's that guy from over there. Okay, yeah. They all knew each other, right? And that's kind of how these scholars are. They all went to Cambridge. They all went to Oxford, which is all in the same general county, and they all knew each other. And they would keep bumping into each other, and each one had something, like in the Yardbirds, each one had a unique talent that they could bring to the organization to further their art. And uh, that's kind of the way it works out with this. Robert Barnes was the prior, or the head, of the house, the Augustinian house, where Coverdale was at. So he was very influential because he was the boss. But see, Barnes, this guy had studied on the continent under Erasmus. And he had humanistic sympathies. And I don't know if you remember when I talked about humanism last time. Humanism then is, is not like humanism now. Uh, they were, this was, there was a scholarship thing for them about applying uh, new, for them, scholarship methods going back to the original languages for books and and different things, and trying to find sources. So these guys were, they were the cutting edge, kind of, of the educational establishment at the time. Now it is thought by some that uh, he influenced the students to have a more open mind. And it helped nudge them towards being reformers, because a lot of his students became reformers. Barnes himself was tried twice for heresy. It wasn't unnoticed that he had these ideas. During his first trial in 1526, Coverdale was his secretary at the trial. So Coverdale and him were very tight. While Barnes was treated leniently at that trial, unfortunately, about 20 years later, he was burned at the stake for heresy. The next influential person to enter Coverdale's life was Thomas Cromwell. Not to be confused with Oliver Cromwell, okay, but Thomas Cromwell. Thomas Cromwell was the Earl of Essex. 
And he had political power in the royal court. He was a very powerful man in the royal court. Because Coverdale knew him, he got a very powerful mentor and a very powerful protector. And that's important too in the intrigues of the court. And all these ideas that he was learning that did affect him. In 1528, Coverdale left the Augustinian order. His convictions began to move away from the Catholic Church and moved him radically in the direction of reform and Protestants. This is what I think of the writer. He stopped wearing ecclesiastical garments and began to openly preach against the Roman Catholic doctrines of transubstantiation, the veneration of sacred images, and confession to a priest. Now remember, he is a Roman Catholic priest himself. He was still one. But he's talking about all these things. That, that's a good way to tick off your employer, <laughs> just, to, just to go against his rules. Right? Now, these, his views were very dangerous. And due to the political and the religious atmosphere at the time, he decided that his best bet was to flee to the continent and get out of England, which he did. So Cover Coverdale moved from England, and he moved to the city of Antwerp. In Antwerp, Coverdale met the next highly influential person in his story, William Tyndale. Coverdale assisted Tyndale in revising and completing his English New Testament. And after Tyndale was betrayed and arrested, Coverdale continued to quietly work on Tyndale's English Bible. And in 1535, Coverdale printed the first complete Bible in English, and it was called the Coverdale Bible after him. Well, Tyndale burned at the stake for printing a New Testament, and then Coverdale prints a whole Bible. How can he get away with that? You know, Coverdale's Bible was accepted, and he wasn't arrested for two main reasons. One, at that time, a convocation of this bishops suggested to King Henry VIII that an English language Bible was needed for the empire. And second, Coverdale openly dedicated his Bible to the king. They fled him to his majesty. See, so these two kind of things work in Coverdale's favor. The way I like to think of this story is, you know, the Pope hated the idea of native language Bibles. Because if you could read it in your own language, then you could question. And they did not want their authority questioned, so native language Bibles were outlawed. But I can kind of imagine, and it's just me imagining it may not have happened, that all these bishops, these guys are hanging out with Henry the Eighth going, Hey, you know what really took off the Pope? <laughs> An English language Bible. And they're like, well, we're going to get one. And Coverdale goes, uh, here? It was already done. So it was it, that a turn of fate that he had all this completed already. And when they wanted the Bible, he just goes, oh, I have one. Would you like it? Well, I'm oversimplifying that. <laughs> for comedic effect. But I mean, you know, it's kind of like that. Coverdale's translation consisted of Tyndale's 1534 edition of the New Testament, Tyndale's translation of the Pentateuch, Tyndale's translation of Jonah, and the remainder was Coverdale's own translation of the rest of the Bible. Now, he drew, for his translations, from the book works of Luther and other uh, European translators. It's funny thing about Coverdale, and this is probably the only fault that people find with him, is he translated from Latin, from German, and from other English sources because 
unlike Tyndale and some of the other translators, he was not really well versed in Greek and Hebrew. Not like they were. Now, Coverdale's translation was the first officially recognized English translation of the Bible. Now, here's what's interesting about this Bible. Coverdale's translation of the book of Psalms became the basis for the Psalter in the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. Uh, if you notice the thing down, I have a sign down there that talks about what is a Psalter. The Psalter is putting this, is the Psalms that have been rewritten, re-edited, so they are in a meter, and so they kind of rhyme. It's making the Psalms into a song. That was the first songbook that we can, we can look at. This Psalter has been in use since 1662, almost up to the modern day. A lot of people don't know that. It was still being printed in the 60s. Uh, one, one source that I looked at said that uh, it was actually being printed in Canada in the 70s. It was that good. It was so, if it works, I've seen this. I think I have a copy at home. Uh, they, they get re-edited every once in a while, so I'm not sure if it's actually his. But uh, yeah, you can you can get that the 1662 Psalter. It's, they still print it. You can still buy it. The next major project that Coverdale worked on was the Matthew Bible. Now, the Matthew Bible received its name from Thomas Matthew, uh, who didn't exist. That was the name of the person who supposedly edited the Bible. Now remember at the time, you can't print an English Bible, so they, they made up a name so they could print an English Bible. Uh, the real editor was a guy named John Rogers. That was his, you know, Matthew was his alias. Um, Rogers is another one of these guys. He's working directly with Coverdale. This is the funny thing about Coverdale. If you're noticing that half of the people that Coverdale worked with get a burning mistake, right? So his headmaster in his priory is executed for heresy. He works with Tyndale. Tyndale is executed for heresy. And then he works with John Rogers and John Rogers is executed for heresy because they have the audacity of challenging the church. Uh, actually, and John Rogers is mentioned, we talked about Hawks' Book of Martyrs, he's actually mentioned it. That, that's not to say something about Coverdale, it's just that he's one of the luckiest men alive, I think you could say, because he kept being missed when they had persecutions. I think God had a plan for this guy. And that's why this kind of thing happened. Now Matthew's Bible consisted of Tyndale's New Testament, Tyndale's translations of the Pentateuch, parts of Joshua, and Chronicles. And then with the remainder of the Bible being Coverdale's work. Um, in case you haven't caught this part by now, uh, Tyndale didn't live long enough to finish his entire Bible doing the entire Bible. So that's why he keeps mentioning these individual books. That's, it. that's as far as he got before he was arrested. Now, unfortunately, Matthew's Bible was controversial, controversial, theologically. And the imprint of Tyndale's translation was very apparent. Now, remember that uh, the New Testament was Tyndale's New Testament. And it was, it was pretty obvious for people who knew anything about it. It's like, wait a minute, you just, you just copy it over to the test and make something new. Mm -hmm. And uh, so Thomas Cromwell, his, uh, his mentor, and Bishop Cranmer, who was the head of the uh, English church at the time, were very concerned that if Henry VIII found out about this connection with Tyndale, uh, there might be problems for them. Because it was Henry who ordered that Tyndale would be executed. So they had to do something about that. So 
And what they did is they packed up Coverdale and sent them to Paris. They had another project already in the works. Thomas Cromwell sent Coverdale to Paris to supervise the creation and printing of a new version because of the problems with the Matthew Bible. They were printing what was to become the Great Bible. And that started in 1538. Now, this is why I think it's funny, because we don't even think like this now, but that's what they had to do. Paris was chosen as a place to print it because they wanted to use a specific font type, and only that guy had that font. So they went to Paris where the font was. They didn't send the font to them. They went to where the font was. Now, unfortunately, anti-Protestant authorities caught wind of this, that they were printing a new English Bible in Paris, and they went there, stopped the printing, confiscated all of the existing printing pages, ran them off. Ah. But as often happens, this was a bit of a comedy of errors. He said, they took all these pages from the printer, and then they put them up for auction and scrap. So, guess who bought them? Yeah. The pages were bought by those people that were printing them. They collected them up, they collected the pages, and they collected the font from the guy who was the printer in, in Paris, took it all back to London, and finished it. Printing resumed, it was completed in England, and then we have the Great Bible. Now, there was a reason it was called the Great Bible. And that was because of its size. It was big. You know, first printing anyway was big. I've got, I've got some copies of pages from a great Bible. And eventually they made like a pocket size version. And you can get those. But the original one was 14 and a half by 9 and a quarter inches. I mean, it was big. And uh, so the idea with the Great Bible was that they would print enough of these and they would issue one to each church. So each church would have its own Bible. And I had a great picture, and I wish I could show it. What they would do was they would take the Bible and they'd have a lectern, and they would chain the Bible to the lectern. Like there was a little cast on the side of it, and so they could connect the chain there, and then it was connected to to the lectern, and if you wanted to read the Bible, you could read the Bible, but you had to go there. But you had to do it while it was on this lectern. You weren't about to take it home. And uh, I think if I have a photo, well not a photo, but I have an engraving of that. <laughs> it's hilarious. We tried to reproduce that in the museum, but I didn't do a real good job of it. But I, I just think it's, it's amazing. You know, we talk about in the Bible, cases of Bibles. That's what we do, right? If you want a Bible and you've got a dollar and a quarter, you can go down to Dollar Tree and get a Bible. Bibles were so rare and expensive that back then they had to chain them to a pulpit so he couldn't steal it. I thought that was pretty amazing. Now, in 1539, it was a dark year in England. The persecution started again. Laws were passed that effectively ended religious toleration. Coverdale's mentor and protector, Thomas Cromwell, was arrested and executed for treason, although it was doubted that the charges were true. But that's the way it worked. Right? You could get arrested for an accusation. Sometimes you go to jail and get executed for an accusation. Politics is funny. Coverdale left England again for the continent, and again he settled in France. Now it was during this time frame that he happened to meet more leaders in the Reformation movement, including this guy, John Calvin, who he would later work for and meet again. Now, Coverdale wasn't idle during this time, which is, I think is interesting. He's doing a bunch of other stuff. Life goes on, right? While he's there, he received a Doctor of Theology degree from 
the university at Tübingen, and he wrote tracts about the Reformation. So he was pretty busy. He says, I'm taking it that these, these gap periods, he was like a parish priest or something, because he had to do something for a living. Now, Coverdale returned to England in 1548. There was a new king. Things were better. And Coverdale was actually well received by the court. This is what I think is interesting to you. Again, the circumstances happen to be he became the royal chaplain at Windsor, you know, like palace, and was given the distinction of preaching the sermon for the funeral of Catherine Parr, Queen Dowager. You know who Catherine Parr is? She's one of the six wives of Henry VIII. She's the one that survived. And he was, he was like her personal minister and did her funeral. And in 1551, he was appointed as Bishop of Exeter, which is, remember his mentor was the Earl of Exeter. So he got to come home and, and become Bishop uh, where he was from. Unfortunately, as many things happened in the Middle Ages, these good times were not to last. Mary I took the throne after Edward. Now Mary, she was determined to return the Church of England to Catholicism. So she began persecutions. Coverdale was arrested. He was stripped of his position as bishop. But due to political pull by his brother-in-law, again, he just happens to know somebody who knows somebody. <laughs> His sister happened to be married to a, a, a nobleman in Denmark, and he was allowed to leave England and go to Denmark. And then in 1558, he decided he was going to settle in Geneva, Switzerland. And this happened to be that while he was in Geneva, he was part of the company that produced the Geneva Bible. Remember, he was friends with John Calvin. Now, while he was not primarily a translator in this company, he did offer valuable assistance to them because he had already completed several versions of the Bible by himself. We had a lot of experience. And the history of the Geneva, of course, the Geneva New Testament was published in 1557, and the full Geneva Bible was printed in 1540. representations of those down there. Again, history goes on. And he's allowed to return to England. So in 1559, he goes home. And he became the rector at St. Magnus, the Martyr Church, in London. And that's basically where he stayed. And it's funny about him, although he was an Anglican minister, he was really popular with the Puritans because of his stances against ceremonies and against excessive priestly garments. Oh, and in, it, in amongst all of this stuff that he was doing, he got married twice. <laughs> yeah, I think it's pretty amazing. His first wife died. His second wife outlived him. Coverdale passed away in 1569. He was a really popular guy. And he had a large number of mourners at his funeral. He was buried at St. Magnus Church, the church that he pastored. And there's a plaque on the wall commemorating him there. The other recognition that Coverdale has gotten is Coverdale has been recognized as a saint by the Anglican Church. And he's recognized on the church calendar with William Tyndale on October 6th. He has his own day on the calendar. Kind of shows. The part that you're probably all wondering, why do I say that he was the secret agent of the Reformation? Well, if you kind of got adrift from the other parts of the story, He was this everyman. He was kind of normal, and he worked quietly in the background. He was 
like invisible. But he did a lot. While he was not famous like the other reformers, God placed him in positions where he could be used. Miles was a faithful man. That's the thing about his character. He performed whatever duties he was given with diligence and excellence. Now, I really think that because he was involved as a background guy, that many of these projects were able to be completed and be as influential as they are. You know, it's, it's, it's like playing football. You only hear about the quarterback, but that quarterback couldn't win a game if he didn't have linebackers, right? Coverdale was a linebacker. He didn't necessarily look for fame and fortune and stuff. He just did his job. He was a regular guy. He did his job. But his lack of notoriety also kept him from being arrested during different persecutions. He was rarely on anybody's radar because he was just some funny guy. What I also think is interesting about him and why I call him kind of a secret agent, while he was a part of the system, he didn't agree with it. And he tried to change the system from within. So I think this is a good example for us today. Uh, I don't know, I guess since the 60s, you get the idea that we got to burn everything down and start all over again. Well, that kind of wasn't Coverdale's idea. He just, let's fix what's broke and not tear the whole thing down. Now, was that practical? Well, no, because it didn't work that way. But, you know, he was a guy doing what he thought was right. But he didn't make waves. I mean, I think that's interesting. I mean, I've met people like that, and I've done these kind of things myself, actually. Um, there's a way that you can present things that don't make waves. And that's the kind of guy he was. He was pretty diplomatic, and he just quietly did what he was supposed to do. Now, Coverdale had a direct influence on four English Bible versions. Tyndale's Bible, his own Coverdale Bible, Matthew Bible, and the Great Bible. He had an indirect influence on three others. The Geneva, the Bishops, and the King James Bible. James, well, he was like dead by the time the King James Bible came out. Yeah. But remember, the King James is a revision of a revision. So, the stuff that Tyndale had and, and Coverdale had put together were actually used for the making of the King James Bible. And there's statistics anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of the King James Bible is based on those guys' work. Now here's what's interesting. Some, some other trivia about Tr Tyndale. His translation of the Psalms was used in the Book of Common Prayer. We already talked about that. And here's one I found which was interesting. Coverdale's Psalms was the source for the quotes of the Psalms and Handel's Messiah. And his writings on Reformation in the church and on Christian living were very influential in his time. And you can still get them. There are people that still, that still reproduce that and print it. So he was, he was a great thinker, too, as far as what he was doing. He was very, like I say, he was he was very influential in his time. He was kind of forgotten over the centuries, but he was somebody who was very important at the time. So Miles Coverdale was God's secret agent, and he was his good and faithful servant in bringing the Bible into the English language. 